Hello, ECE205. In this lecture, we're going to extend the types of differential equations that we've examined. We have a fair bit of stuff that I want to make through. Again, I don't think I'll make it through all the slides, but we'll see. So let's jump into the meat here. Okay, so, so far in this course, we've really only considered special cases of first order differential equations of this form. So notice that every equation that we've considered can in fact be written in this form. Uh, really, we don't need this f of x because all of that can be contained and absorbed by this m function here. Now, ODEs of this form are quite interesting, but they do unfortunately limit the scope of the physical problems that we can examine. The reason being is the only physical terms that we can consider are some quantity, some variable, and well, some variable that the quantity depends on, and derivatives of that quantity. So we can really only talk about the, quote, velocity, the rate of change, right? In many physical problems, we have acceleration, though, right? We have second derivatives. Like, very importantly, as I talked about in the first class, f is equal to ma is a common way that we end up deriving differential equations, and the acceleration term here inherently is going to be a second derivative of the position function or derivative of velocity in some cases, that can be useful. So we thus are now going to extend the range of differential equations we look at to include these type of terms. So in particular, we're going to look at uh, second order linear ordinary differential equations of this form. Okay, so why are we limiting ourselves to this form? Why aren't we doing nonlinear stuff? Well, it turns out that just like with how nonlinear things for the first order case were quite difficult to solve, and in fact we had a proof that oftentimes we could not find an explicit solution and would have to suffice with the implicit solution that might not actually contain all of the possible solutions, i.e. there could potentially be no general solution. All of those problems become even worse with nonlinear second order differential equations. Thus, we're going to limit the scope of what we examine so that we can actually explore the solutions a little bit, right? So the natural question that might pop up is, well, how did I go about solving this method and how can that potentially be applied down here? Well, generally speaking, most of the methods that we ended up using really involved isolating this where one side would only depend on y and the other side would only depend on x and then integrating both sides and then to deal with the forcing term here i would use variation of parameters so does that work here well unlike in the case of first order linear, linear odes i can no longer solve y by isolating for this into other y terms and integrating because i still have this y double prime term that i'd still have to do something with so that general technique does not work here. Now there are some techniques that you can use, like you can split this into two different first order equations and try to do that. But yeah, in general, there's no longer going to be a formula for the general solution for all of the cases to one. Okay, so previously we had that nice e to the negative integral of p of x dx that no longer exists for second order linear equations of this form. Okay, so what are we going to talk about in this lecture? Well, in this lecture, we're going to, one, examine some properties of the homogeneous case of this. So we're going to take this equation, get rid of the f of x by letting it equal its zero, and we're going to examine when we have solutions, what can we say about the solutions, how can we potentially use solutions to build a general solution. Uh, previously over here, I could just use that constant and I called it a day, that's no longer the case. And we'll discuss that there. And this will be the first half of the lecture or the first vast majority of the slides, to be honest. And then secondly, we're going to talk about how to solve one in the case where P of X and Q of X are just constants. And this F of X is equal to zero. In the future next two lectures uh, in chapter five, we'll then kind of relax some of these assumptions to discuss how to find other solutions. Okay, so without further ado, let's jump in. Okay, so we're going to start with a nice theorem that we will present without proof. Uh, the text doesn't prove it as well. So suppose P and Q are continuous on some open interval. So this is to say both of these functions are continuous on the same open interval. And then let x not be any point in a comma b, and let these two uh, k not k1 be arbitrary real numbers. 
then this initial value problem, so uh, linear second order differential equation, non-constant coefficients, homogeneous, with these two initial conditions, one here and one here, has a unique solution on a comma b. Well, wait, previously we only had one initial condition. Why do we have two now? Well, when you have a first order differential equation, if you just want to kind of think of the well, all the cases that we examined, you get one arbitrary constant that matters at the end of the day. In some steps, you could generate arbitrary constants, but at the end of the day, all of those get absorbed into one arbitrary constant. Well, when you have a second order differential equation, uh, you need to integrate twice, so to speak, uh, and that each time you'll get a constant of integration, so you need two initial conditions to get rid of them. So just to kind of see why that could be the case, here, if you let all of this stuff be zero, you get y double prime is equal to zero. And if you integrate it, you get one constant. And then if you integrate again to solve for y, you get two constants. In general, that will be the case, even though that technique of integrating won't work to get the solution. Okay, so again, we're not going to prove this, but we will note that in the proof for 5.1.1, you don't actually find the function itself that satisfies this, you simply prove that such a solution exists, okay? So the work for this theorem is not a constructive proof. It's not like a, here's the function that satisfies this, we're done. It's more of a, there exists a function that has these properties, therefore a solution exists. And that's the reason why we're not going to prove it. It's not constructive, so it doesn't really lead much light towards solving these uh, problems. So in kind of a graduate level course, that's the type of thing you would cover, but not here. Or if it was at like a pure mathy class where the focus was on existence of solutions, that type of a thing. Okay, so now before we get into more theorems and kind of get bogged down, let's just kind of see this theorem in action a little bit and actually find a solution for one of these. So first we want to show that there's a unique solution for all initial value problems to this. Uh, difference equation here, or initial value problem here. Next, we want to show that this function is a solution to this differential equation. And finally, we want to solve the initial value problem in part one, ultimately using our work in number two. So let's go over to Mr. Paint and check this one out. Okay, so for the first thing, if I want to show that there's a unique solution to this, what I'm ultimately going to use is this theorem 5.1.1. So just putting these next to each other so you can see both bits in action. Okay, so here, this equation is of this form, right? So here you could say something like, note that DE1, if I give it a name, is of the form found in theorem 5.1.1. Now expi explicitly here, we wanna say that this is with, well, how do I put this into this form? Well, the initial conditions are already of that form, so I don't have anything to do there. So really all I need to do is identify this p of x and this q of x function. So here, p of x is going to simply be equal to zero identically, and q of x, in this case, that is just going to be the function attached to this y, so q of x will simply be minus one. Okay, so what do I know about these functions? Well, in order for there to be a unique solution, well, in order for this theorem to apply to tell me there's a unique solution, I need these two functions to be continuous on some open interval. Well, these two functions are continuous everywhere. So I can say something like, since P and Q are continuous everywhere, then theorem 5.1.1 will tell us that this has a solution for all real numbers. And in particular, a unique solution for all real numbers x naught that we could possibly want. So from here, since x naught can be any value that I possibly want it to be, and a priori in the question that I had here, there's no restriction on k naught and k1, and in this theorem, there's no restriction on k naught and k1, this tells me that this has a unique solution for all initial value problems, okay? So that's how in practice one would use this theorem to guarantee that there is a solution. Okay, so why are these existence solutions useful? Well, as an engineer, oftentimes you might just say, hey, I could just try to throw that into a calculator and find a solution. Well, if there is no solution, then you can't find a solution, so you're wasting your time, right? 
So even in an applied math context, these existence solutions are very, very important, okay? So keep that in mind that the scope of which you're actually using these, the, this material is pretty big. Okay, so now let's look at number two. So for two, I want to show that y is equal to this thing is a solution to this differential equation. Well, if I want to do that, all I need to do is plug y into this uh, equation here. So let's see what happens when I take derivatives. Well, if I take the first derivative, I get this. And when I take the second derivative, I get this. So pretty clearly, if I take my second derivative and I subtract y from it, what happens? Well, a direct computation gives me and thus, this uh, proposed solution here actually is a solution to this differential equation. Okay, notice here I have two arbitrary parameters instead of one, like I've had in all the previous cases of first order difference equations. And again, that kind of comes from the argument that I've made here where you're going to have to have two either way. It's not a proof, I'm just telling you that's going to be the case. Okay, so now let's look at part three. So for part three, we want to actually solve the initial value problem in part one. Well, all I know from my work in part one is that there's a unique solution to it. And from part two, I found this solution that kind of looks like a general solution. It may or may not be because we haven't defined that yet, but it kind of looks like what our general solutions look like, right? So if I want to try to use this previous work to solve the initial value problem, what I'm going to try to do is take this function here and use it with these two initial conditions here to try to find if I can solve for these coefficients. So let's do that. So it's pretty straightforward to do this, so I'll just do it kind of in compilation form where I speed it up, just to save a little bit of time here. Okay, so now I want to solve this for C1 and C2, so we can note that I can if I add these uh, equations together, this term vanishes. And if I subtract them together, this first term vanishes. So that's what I'll do here. Okay, so there is my solution. So if I wanna put all this together, I just take these coefficients that I found and plug them back into here. So let's just do this in montage version. And there we go. We solved a second order linear partial differential equation with constant coefficients that's also homogeneous. Not the coefficients, but the equation itself. Okay, so putting that in lecture slide form, there we go. It's a little bit compressed there, but what can I do? It doesn't really fit on the slide. Anyways, uh, so yeah, and note that this is a modified version of 5.1.1 in Trench. There they only did one particular initial condition, but it's simple enough to get all of the potential initial conditions. So there we go. Okay, so let's notice something here. Here, this is a linear combination, stealing words from linear algebra, of these two functions e to the x and e to the negative x. And this uh, e to the x is a solution in its own right, and so is this e to the negative x, it's also a solution, right? And the linear combination was, that's interesting. Does this hold in general? Yes. If y1 and y2 are solutions to a homogeneous equation of this form, where here I have absolutely no restrictions on p of x and q of x, they don't need to be differentiable, they no, don't need to be continuous, they don't even need to be continuous at any given point. They can be god-awful functions. They just have to be functions of x here. Then any linear combination, y sub g of these two solutions of y1 and y2, uh, is going to also be a solution to this homogeneous equation. So let's just give a very quick rundown of this proof, uh, just kind of a very quick TLDR version, but it's pretty obvious why this thing should work. Okay, so here, if I take this function, and plug it into these three terms, then TLDR, I can split this up by kind of combining the terms that involve y1 and then the terms that involve y2. So if I take the y1 terms, I'm going to get something that looks like cy1 double prime plus p of x 
times y1 prime plus q of x. And here there's a typo, this needs to be a y, and I will fix that right now. Okay, it's fixed in the slides. And then when I do this whole thing again by splitting up the second term here, the c2y2, I get something that looks very similar to this, but instead of having involving y1, it then involves y2. So I get this. Here, I know since y1 solves the equation, this is zero. And since y2 solves the equation, I know this thing is zero. So when I do plug this into the equation, I do get something that is in fact valid. So explicitly, when I plug this in, I get zero plus zero and then equals zero. So again, be a little bit cautious with plugging in the equals zero here until you explicitly prove it. But yeah, that's kind of a TLDR here of why this would be true. So again, note, these functions do not need to be continuous. Uh, linear superposition, which is the process of adding two linear solutions together to get another solution, is valid even in the case where things aren't continuous, okay? And for a formal proof of this, see Trench, but for the lectures, that's based the basic idea there. Okay, so this idea that I can find two solutions to try to construct other solutions can be formalized, and that's what we're going to do now. Okay, so in light of this theorem, we're going to define some useful terms that we'll use going forward. A set of functions, y1, y2, is called a fundamental set of solutions of a linear second order differential equation on some interval if every single solution of the differential equation in question can be written as a linear combination of y1 and y2. Okay, so here in general, you can just call it a fundamental set, this quantification of the of the solutions of a sec linear second order DE on this is purely to be a bit more precise here. So if I have a second order differential equation, a fundamental set will contain exactly two functions. If I have a third order linear differential equation, it'll contain three. If I have an nth order linear differential equation, it'll contain n functions. So that's kind of how this generalizes. So here you can just call this a fundamental set, but I just want to make that point a little bit carefully there, okay? So now beyond here, we call the linear combination, this thing, the general solution to the linear second order differential equation on this. So the key idea here is that if y1 and y2 form a fundamental set, then the general solution is just an arbitrary linear combination of those two functions. Okay, so this is a generalization of the idea of a general solution that we had before, where here these coefficients can be arbitrary, and no matter what coefficient I pick, this uh, linear combination will be a solution, purely because y1 and y2 are solutions, and the theorem 5.1.2, and it's going to turn out that every single solution to that linear second order differential equation can also be written in this form. So this is, in fact, the same idea of general solution that we discussed previously. Namely, those two points are still valid just in this more general context. Now, this idea of writing this function as a linear combination of these other two functions is very much related to ideas from linear algebra. In linear algebra, you could write one vector as a linear combination of bases vectors, and the key idea there is that the bases vectors were lit guaranteed to be linearly independent. And that linearly independence gave you a unique way of writing these uh, a vector as a linear combination of other, other vectors. So we take that idea and we kind of generalize it to differential equations. So here, we say that two functions, y1 and y2, are linearly independent on some set if neither is a constant multiple of the other, and again, this is just like linearly independence from linear algebra, right? If I have a collection of two vectors, that collection is linearly independent if and only if one's not a scalar multiple of the other. Okay, so if I wanted to do this with three or more functions, then I have to generalize my idea of linearly independence just like I did in linear algebra, but we're not actually going to do that for this course, but just keep that in mind just in case you ever run into it. Now, one other thing, if y1 and y2 are two linearly independent functions on this interval, then we say that the set is linearly independent on a comma b. Again, same nomenclature from linear algebra, just slightly different objects, functions versus vectors. Now, just to make it a little bit more explicit, tying this to linear algebra, if we have a fundamental set of solutions s, if this thing here exists, then 
it's going to turn out that S is in some sense a basis for the set of all solutions. Namely, any solution to the second order linear differential equation will be able to be written as a linear combination of those elements of that fundamental set. Okay, so putting all this together, if we can find a way to build a fundamental set, then we can find all the solutions to the differential equation. Further, if we can find a way to confirm whether or not something's a fundamental set without showing that the general solution is written in this form, which in general can be a very difficult task, then we can find all of the solutions to the differential equation and come up with a quick test to say, hey, yes, this is the general solution. So this naturally begs the question, can I do this? Well, no, game over. It's like, yes, I can do this, and we'll quantify it in a theorem, and we'll spend the next several slides building up the machinery to prove that theorem. Our new goal is to prove this theorem. Suppose P and Q are continuous on this set here, then a set of solutions of this equation on this interval AB is going to be a fundamental set if and only if this is linearly independent on AB. So what this solution let or what this theorem lets me do is say, hey, if I find two solutions and I can show those solutions are linearly independent, then there's my general solution. I'm done. QED. Nothing else to say there. Okay, so we're going to prove this shortly, but first I'm going to go through an example here, and then we'll kind of build up motiv motivation for why this thing might be true and build a few other theorems. Okay, so let's go to Mr. Pate and check this out. Okay, so here I can kind of split this up. And I know pretty clearly that y1 is equal to e to the x. This thing is going to be a solution to this. Just take its derivative. And this thing here, y2, is equal to e to the minus x. This also solves the differential equation. OK, so I have two solutions here that solve it. So once I prove this theorem, what I'll be able to do is just note, hey, if those two functions, if I throw them into a set, if that set is linearly independent, then I can construct the general solution to be the arbitrary linear combination. So how do I check for that? Well, I want to make sure that these aren't constant multiples of each other. So if I take y1 divided by y2, this will just be e to the x divided by e to the minus x, and this would simply be equal to e to the 2x. Okay? e to the 2x is not equal to some constant right, on this interval. Therefore, I know that these are linearly independent. And thus, this thing here will be a fundamental solution. Or sorry, a general solution. OK, so that's very useful. Uh, it doesn't tell me how to find these solutions, but it says if I can, then I can construct the general solution. OK, and for a kind of this worked out C trench, I don't really have space here. So I don't want to expand too many more slides. So I'll suppress the work here in the final slides there. But it's pretty simple to prove. And again, the work's in trench. OK, so now if I want to try to prove this theorem, I really need to show that if this thing is a fundamental set, then uh, it's linearly independent. And if it's linearly independent, then it is a fundamental set. But while I know quite a bit about linear independence, I just divide them and see if it's a constant or not, how do I show if something's a fundamental set? Well, currently, the only thing we have is the definition that we gave over here is that every solution of the differential equation can be written as this linear combination of these two functions. That's pretty vague. So let's explore this concept and in the process learn a fair bit about what fundamental sets really are and what's really happening here. Uh, these kind of insights I think are quite valuable for being able to understand what you're actually doing when you solve these types of equations. Okay, so suppose P and Q are continuous on an open interval, right? That's my assumptions that I had here. And let's also suppose that this is a fundamental set for this thing here. Our goal is to get a nice quantification for when something is a fundamental set. And ultimately, we're going to try to use that quantification to generate a proof for the previous theorem that we mentioned. OK, so since this thing is a fundamental set, the only thing I really know is that any solution of 2, any solution of this difference equation, can be written as this thing for some constant c1 and c2. That's by definition, what it means to be a fundamental set. So this is an if and only if statement here. So this doesn't really tell me anything for how to try to quantify when this is a fundamental set. 
So what I'm going to actually do is I'm going to look at equation two with some extra initial conditions and that will help me. How does that help me? Well, I have theorem 5.1.1. It says that for any x naught in this open interval and for any real numbers k0 and k1, this initial value problem has a unique solution. Thus, if this thing is a fundamental set, then all solutions can be written in this form. And that would mean that it would need to be the case that this functional form here can satisfy all initial conditions of this form. Okay, so to spell this out on the slides, in other words, this thing is going to be a fundamental set for one if and only if this uh, function here satisfies all of the possible initial conditions here and here. Okay, so now I've turned this being a fundamental set into the existence of a solution to two linear equations. That's linear algebra. Okay, so let's kind of spill this out a little bit. Thus, for any choice of x or k0 and k1 and r, we need this system of linear equations to have a solution. So the first one, if I just plug in, uh, well, if I use this functional form here into this expression, I get c1y1 of x0 plus c2 y2 of x0 needs to be equal to k0. And when I take this and plug it into the second condition I need to satisfy, I get the derivatives evaluated at those points and same linear combination. So we need this thing to have a solution c1, c2 for all of these values of k0 and k1. Okay, when does this happen? Well, there's a few ways that you can look at this. The way in your text assumes that you haven't had like a Math 115 class, which you've all had, uh, and they just manually solve this via the method of elimination. Here, let's do something a little bit more fancy, which ultimately gives us a little bit better insight into what's happening. Okay, so here's the equations we want to solve. And you can recall, this is literally just a system of linear equations. This is a number, this is a number, this is a number, and this is a number. And these are two constants that were given to us. We don't know what they are, they're just some numbers that Johnny gives to us or whoever. Okay, so here, this can be written in matrix form, right? So just recall, I can say my C1, C2, and I can rewrite this whole thing as this matrix times this vector. So explicitly, a matrix vector multiplication would give me this times this plus this times this is equal to that, which is my first equation. Similar expression for the bottom term. Okay, so from here, we can ask, when does this thing have a solution? Well, in linear algebra, we actually quantified that. From linear algebra, we know this thing has a solution if and only if this determinant, which I'm going to give a name called W of x naught, or the Ronskin evaluated at x naught, if and only if this thing, which again, definition of determinant here, determinant of a two by two would be this times this minus that times that. So this definition here is not equal to zero. Okay, so for this class, you have some options. I personally would, the way that I memorize the Ron skin is via this definition here. Uh, using it via this definition generalizes nicely to higher order differential equations, which we're not going to do, but that's why I prefer that definition of the Ron skin. But you could just memorize it via this expression here. That's up to you, your choice. And again, just in text, this above determinant is called the Ronskin at x0. It's very important because it quantifies when you have a fundamental solution, Well, as we'll see soon. Okay, so the above work, if we put all of it together, now tells us that this thing satisfies these two initial conditions for any possible values of x0, or k0 and k1 and x0 in that interval. So for some of this, if and only if the Ron skin is non-zero at all of these points x0 in uh, that interval. Okay, so if I tie this together with my previous if and only if statement, I now can say that this set is a fundamental set if and only if the Ron skin is non-zero for all points in the interval of validity. And here, since the equations are linear, at the end of the day, the interval of validity will simply be the largest interval upon which those p of x and q of x functions are continuous. Well, both continuous. Okay, so now all I have to do is determine when w of x is non-zero on this interval. 
oh, that sounds super fun and super easy to do, right? Finding the zeros of an arbitrary function is something we all know how to do. Well, sadly, if you're not aware of this theorem, if you have a polynomial of fifth order or higher, fifth degree or higher, so something of this form, then there's a theorem uh, from Galois theory stating that there is no general solution that you can find to find these roots. Fun times. Okay, so this doesn't make things super nice, right? Because finding those zeros, that can be very difficult. I can give you trillions of Ron skins, well, infinitely many Ron skins, that you can't actually prove that they're non-zero by checking each and every value of x and a, b. Thus, since general, uh, in general, roots can be hard to find, if you can find a shortcut for solving this, that would be very nice. Well, sometimes we can have nice things. Theorem 5.1.4. Suppose P and Q are continuous on some interval and let Y1 and Y2 be solutions to our standard equation that we've been looking at for quite a while on this interval and define the Ron skin to be as we found it to be earlier. Then, if x is any point in this interval a, b, then it turns out that the Ron skin, this w as a function of x, is exactly equal to this expression here on this interval. This formula has a name. It is called Abel's formula. I would recommend knowing how to drive it. It's not too bad. I'll kind of hand wave it in a second, but at a minimum you should memorize this because it's a quite useful formula for a handful of cases. Or at worst such or worst case scenario, know when this could potentially be useful, which we'll see that kind of later on, uh, and then kind of know that it's a thing and then look up the formula if you ever forget it. Okay, so from here I can make some conclusions. This expression here is never zero, like never ever. So this lets me make a statement. Therefore, either W has no zeros in A and B, and this is gonna be in the case where W of X naught for some arbitrary point X naught in the interval is equal, or is not equal to zero, or W is identically zero in A, B. Namely, uh, this is explicitly stating if I wanna find, uh, to, or if I wanna to check to see if W of X is equal to zero, all I have to do is plug in a single value for x within that interval, and if that value is 0, then w is 0 everywhere, and if that value is non-zero, then w has no zeros. Okay, so for a proof of this theorem, I'm not going to go through the proof explicitly. It's in trench, it's pretty straightforward to follow, I highly recommend you do it, but the basic idea is, if you take this expression here for the Ronskin, and differentiate it with respect to your independent variable, then you get some stuff on the right-hand side that you can then use the fact that these things are solutions to this equation to rewrite it so that the right-hand side becomes negative p times the Ronskin. Okay, so you kind of do some simple algebra there. And then we know how to find solutions to equations of that form, right? because that's just sim a simple linear first order equation. So then you just use the fact that the solution to that is going to be simply this thing here, where I then pick my x naught because I start integrating from that point. And I do that because I want to have this term here instead of an arbitrary constant, because if this was an arbitrary constant, then I wouldn't be able to get this theorem. Okay, so definitely check that out. It's not too bad. It should be kind of a short little read. I just want to try to keep this video a little bit shorter just due to the complex nature of some of the stuff we're covering. Okay, so let's just take a step back and look at the progress that we've made towards our goal. Okay, so this was our goal. It was to prove this thing here, that it's a fundamental set if and only if it's linearly independent, because it gives us an easy way to find the general solution. Okay, what progress have we made? Well, namely, we've shown that this thing is a fundamental set if and only if the Ron skin of x has, or is, non-zero for any x in this interval upon which both p and q are continuous. So basically that's just a works from slides 9 through 8 to get those if and only if statements, and then tying that into the if and only if statement from theorem 5.1.4. Okay, so how does this help me? Well, I've made a gap from fundamental set down to the Ronskin being non-zero for any value of x. 
So now if I can prove that 0 w is non-zero on this interval if and only if y1 and y2 are linearly independent, then I'm done. Okay, so it turns out that this is actually a theorem and let's examine it real quick. Okay, suppose P and Q are continuous on AB and again, let these two things be solutions to here. And again, we're going to define the Ronskin to be exactly what we defined it to be above. Then Y1 and Y2 are linearly independent if and only if the Ronskin has no zeros on the set AB. Okay, so again, I'm not going to formally go through the proof here, but the basic idea is we know these things are linearly independent on this thing if and only if they're non-constant. So what we do is we take the ratio of say y2 divided by y1 and take its derivative. When you do that via the quotient rule, you end up getting that the derivative is going to be related to the Ronskin and one of the two functions, depending on which one you choose to define by, divide by. Then these things will be linearly independent if and only if that quantity, that ratio, or the derivative of their ratio is equal to zero everywhere. So then you use the fact that the Ronskin is zero, Ronskin has a zero precisely when it's exactly equal to zero to show that this theorem has to hold. Okay, that's kind of the TLDR, very rough version. Uh, the details are about half a page of text, so it's not too much, but I just want to avoid doing it here so I can keep the video a bit shorter and try to get so some of the letter material I want to cover. Okay, so definitely check that out. It has a little bit of constructive usefulness to it, and it kind of can show you some of the tricks you need to do to build these type of theorems for differential equations. Okay, and with this proven, like once you actually go through the proof of this, we've now proved theorem 1.5.3. Okay, so I can now take all of these ideas and summarize them together in one big theorem. So theorem 5.1.6, Suppose P and Q are continuous and Y1, Y2 solutions to this standard spiel, uh, then the following statements are equivalent. That means to say if one of these is true, then all of them are true. And if one of these is false, then all of them are false. The general solution to this equation on this open interval is given by this. Well, that's going to be true if and only if these things are a fundamental set for three, right? This going from A to B and vice versa, just purely comes from the definition of a fundamental set and the general solution. And now we've shown that this thing can be a fundamental set if and only if it's linearly independent. That's the theorem 5.1.3 that we just spent all that time to prove. And now these things are linearly independent if and only if the Ronskin is non-zero at some point in A comma B. And this really comes from our work on slides eight and nine, I believe, along with theorem 5.1.4. And then theorem 5.1.4 says that if it's non-zero at some point, then the Ronskin is non-zero at all points. Okay, and then finally, if the Ronskin is non-zero at all points for these things, then the work that we've done in, I believe also slides eight and nine, uh, shows that this is true if and only if the general solution has this form, right? That's the thing where we plugged in the initial conditions and found the uh, solution to that uh, linear system of equations. Okay, so a, a if and only if b, if and only if c, if and only if d, if and only if e, if and only if a. So we kind of have that ring, so that proves that all of these are equivalent. So this gives us a powerful tool, right? Uh, in practice, we're now going to find, or use this theorem to find solutions to three by first finding two solutions to the differential equation such that, well, really any of these statements here are true. So in practice, the easiest one to grab is probably just going to be showing that the Ronskin is non-zero somewhere in A comma B. Sometimes, depending on the functional form, it can be pretty hard to prove that Y1 divided by Y2 is constant or is non-constant. Uh, explicitly, you often have to take the derivatives to prove that it's non-constant. And really, this comes from the fact that there's lots of different ways you can write functions. And honest to God, proving that a function is uh, constant can be pretty difficult unless it's one of the classic functions that you know is non-constant. But in either way, you have all of these options here, uh, really these terms here, which C and D are the ones you want to go to. Okay, so what's next? Well, we now know how to find a general solution of a second order uh, linear differential equation from two linearly independent solutions, but how do we find those solutions to start with? I've mentioned nothing on that. I just assumed I found them through some miracle. 
Well, in general, there's no kind of cut and dry formula to find these solutions, but we can have a nice little theorem. If I'm given one solution, I can use that solution to construct a second solution, okay? This theorem isn't in the text, but I want to explicitly spill this theorem out, and you're going to end up using this theorem at some point in the course, whether it's on assignment or on an exam. You will need this somewhere, so definitely know this theorem. Suppose P and Q are continuous on AB, and suppose I have a solution Y1 to this uh, second order linear ODE, okay? And further, I'm going to make the extra assumption that this y1 has no zeros on this uh, interval here. If it does have a zeros, then I have to kind of restrict my solution away from those zeros in the standard way. So now I'm going to do the onzots that I used for variation of parameters. I'm going to let y2 be equal to u times y1, where u is going to solve this differential equation here. Okay. So note, this is different than the differential equation that I had for... Uh, my standard variation of, of parameters method when I was doing applying it to linear equations of first order. And here, the key difference is I now have a y squared instead of a y. So again, k is an arbitrary constant, which we're realistically going to ignore. And p is just any antiderivative of little p of x. Okay, if all of this is true and I pick y in this way such that u satisfies this uh, differential equation here, then it'll turn out that this set will be a fundamental set on AB. So this, this theorem states if we have one solution, we can find another solution. So since this isn't in the uh, text, let's go through a quick proof of this theorem so we can kind of see what happens and see kind of a way that we can work with the Ron skin. It's kind of similar to the proof of one of the previous theorems, but yeah. Okay, so we're going to start off our proof by defining everything. So we're going to let W be the Ronskin of the solution Y1 and this uh, Y2 function. So explicitly just writing this out. So now why did I start with examining the Ronskin? Well, recall if I go back over here to this theorem, uh, if I want to show that these two functions, y1 and y2, form a fundamental set, all I have to do is show that the Ronskin of y1 and y2 is non-zero. So here I'm doing a kind of non-constructive proof and just showing that this thing works. Okay, so now by the definition of Ronskin, I have and here I'm just going to expand everything out. So let's do this with the montage music. And this term here is not equal to zero anywhere, given that k is non-zero. So here, our u prime, we can basically have free reign with picking k. So as long as we pick k is non-zero, then we get this result here. And I just added in that extra constraint here that we actually need. Uh, so yeah, generally speaking, you'll always pick k to be one, but yeah. So for completion, we do need this to be non-zero for this theorem to be true. Okay, so let's just put our concluding sentence here and be done with this proof. Okay, so going back to the slides, uh, we have the proof just kind of written in slide form there. Okay, so if you wanted to prove this from scratch, then you can look at example nine, or sorry, problem nine, in this section, it's not formally written out as a proof, but basically that's where you kind of go through the derivation of getting this formula, and it's kind of useful to do that. And to be honest, a lot of the steps that you do are very similar to the proof of this theorem here. Okay, and the comment you saw down here for a paper for how to do is I wrote out the proof on paper, so yeah. Sorry for that being left in, and I'm 
not going to cut it out just due to time that this video is already taking. Okay, so now we've kind of reduced the amount of work we have to do from finding two solutions that are linearly independent to just finding a single solution. And then we can ultimately use Abel's theorem, which is kind of what we're using in the background here, to find what a second solution should be. Or in particular, find a second solution that will work to give me a fundamental set so I can build the general solution. Okay, so now comes the bad news. In general, finding a single solution to these, even though it exists, doesn't really have a kind of very quick and dirty closed form of trying to find a solution. There's some tricks that you can do, like some of them we won't discuss, but there's a few tricks you can do to find one solution, but generally speaking, there is no formula that works for all differential equations of this form. Sad face. We can, however, restrict our attention to the case where these coefficients are constant and examine constant coefficient first order linear, I'm sorry, second order linear differential equations of this form where a, b, and c are real numbers and a is restricted to not b zero. In that case, we already know how to find the solutions because it's first order. But within this context, we can readily find the solutions. How? Well, it turns out that if you recall from the first lecture where I talked about eigenvalue problems a little bit, that we can use this idea of eigenvalues and eigenfunctions to try to solve this equation here. So if you're not familiar with eigenvalues, eigenfunctions, you don't need to be, but let's just kind of make this connection to linear algebra because I find it quite useful. So how? Eigenvalue problem. So natural question is how in the world is this an eigenvalue problem? Well, I can rewrite this, right? I have this term cy here, so if I pull that to the other side, I can then rewrite this other side here by factoring out the term of y. And this is now some differential operator being applied to y needs to give me minus c times y. Okay, so this is of the form of a uh, eigenvalue problem, namely if this thing was uh, what I called the operator a, this would be a y is equal to minus c y. So it's the eigenvalue problem where the eigenvalue is negative c. Okay, so this doesn't actually help me, us because I still don't know how to solve this readily, right? If a was zero, then I've already examined that case, right? When I had my uh, derivative of uh, y with respect to x is equal to lambda times y. So here, let's try to rewrite this in terms of only first derivatives. Well, I can do that by doing a little bit of cleaning up. So here, if I divide everything through by uh, a, and then here, if I factor out one of the derivatives, I can rewrite this as that. A good exercise would be to verify this. So this has everything in terms of first derivatives. Okay, so how does that help? Well, if recall, we previously found eigenvalues of this thing by solving this differential equation. And when we did this, our solution was simply y e to the lambda times x, where here c can be anything, but we really want to exclude zeros for the same reason why we exclude the zero eigenvector. It just doesn't help us do anything. Okay, so since this left-hand side only involves, say, derivative of y and then apply derivative again of y, it's natural to make the assumption that I could guess that our solutions should have this form where you could add a constant, but I'm not going to for now, okay? So if I do this, when I apply this operator, uh, I'm going to get terms that look like this or scalar multiples of it. And then when I apply this other derivative here, I'm going to get e extra constant scalar popping out. That is the basic idea of how to solve this problem. And that's where all of the terminology that we're going to use for solving this problem comes from, okay? So we first learn how to solve these simple eigenvalue problems here. And then we can generalize this idea by taking linear uh, differential equations with constant coefficients, well, homogeneous differential equations with constant coefficients, and simply turning in them into eigenvalue problems and looking for eigenvalues of this form, okay? That's in general how it works. For this course, we're only going to restrict ourselves to things of this form, or maybe a simple uh, cubic or third order. Uh, okay, so here what we're going to do is we're going to assume that y is equal to e to the lambda x. So really, all this stuff here 
you can ignore if you really want to get bare bones understanding and just jump to this onsatz, but that's why we make that onsatz. Okay, so if we assume this, then equation five becomes this equation here. Okay, so just taking second derivative gives me that, taking first derivative is that, functions this. So here I can rewrite this thing out just like I did in linear algebra, and I can rewrite it as this product here. Right, so just to clean up the connection a little bit between this and linear algebra. In linear algebra, we had something like ax is equal to lambda x. And from here, what we did is we subtracted this term off and rewrote this as a minus lambda times i. This thing applied to x has to be equal to the zero vector. And then we made the argument that this thing can't be zero to avoid trivial solutions. Therefore, we would have to have that the determinant of this matrix here, which is a polynomial, had to be equal to zero. Okay, so here I'm replacing vectors with these functions. So I'm working in function space instead of vector space, in particular what's called a Hilbert space, but you don't need to know that. And here I get the same thing that this polynomial has to be equal to zero because this thing here can't be zero. Okay, and recall we called the polynomial of this thing when I took its determinant, we called that the characteristic polynomial. So that's what we're going to do here. So going back to our stuff, since e to the lambda x is not equal to zero, we have that the characteristic polynomial, p of lambda is equal to this thing, must satisfy the characteristic equation, p of lambda is equal to zero. Exact same terminology from linear algebra, and we use the same terminology precisely because this thing here is an eigenvalue problem if you write it in this form. Kind of nifty. Again, for TLDR, all you really need to know is assume this and you get the characteristic polynomial and you need to find the zeros for lambda. And if you do that, then your solutions will be of this form where lambda satisfies this equation, okay? But for those of you who recall linear algebra, this is very good connection, I think. Okay, so from here, what do the zeros of this thing look like? Well, in general, if this is a higher order equation, we can't necessarily find the zeros, right? That also ties into the, the thing that I mentioned earlier that for higher order differential equations, we can't necessarily find a closed form solution, okay? In the case where uh, we're only dealing with second derivatives, however, we can find the zeros. From here, we know the zeros, lambda plus or minus, will just be given by this quadratic formula. And again, here I can divide by a since a is non-zero. Okay, so if I evaluate these things for lambda, I just plug them in and I get the solutions. Perfect. So what are my solutions? Well, explicitly, they're going to be y1 is this thing and y2 is this thing. And these are two solutions for five. They're not necessarily linearly independent. I haven't proven that, but these are going to be solutions to this. And if they're not linearly independent, then I need to find a new solution, which we have a theorem for how to do that. Okay, so since I kind of hit the upper limit of the time that I am kind of want to use for this lecture, a lot of the lectures have gone kind of over, I'm going to hold off our examination of three possible cases of this to the next lecture. But the TLDR, just to give you a hint of what we're going to be doing at the beginning of the next lecture, is we're going to examine the three cases where this is positive, zero, or negative. So in the case where this thing is greater than zero, we get two roots and the solutions are kind of just staring at us and it's not hard to prove that they're linearly independent. In the case where it's equal to zero, we only have one solution. So we have to use the theorem that we mentioned earlier to construct a new solution or ultimately just pick an onsatz that works. And in the case where this is negative, well, the functions I get aren't even real valued. So we'll discuss how I can work out that case in the next lecture. Okay, so I want you to read section 5.1, uh, focus on the proofs that I didn't actually cover, and just make sure you understand what each one of the theorems is really giving us. Uh, that's kind of what I want you to get out of the reading slash that first half of the lecture. Uh, I do strongly recommend that you read example 5.1.3 on pages uh, 196 and 197. That's dealing with a linear first order equation with non-constant coefficients. 
a particular example where you can find solutions and verify that the solutions and do kind of all the work that we've done here in a case where we have non-constant coefficients. And again, uh, you should look at questions one through eight and 10 through 23, not all of them, on page 203 and 210 for your practice questions. In the next lecture, we will finish off section 5.2, which we've started with. We kind of have the major starting point there. I swear I didn't do it, I'm in my office. Uh, and then for your meme, here you go. So this is kind of the TLDR meme form of that equation, our theorem one point, or sorry, 5.1.6. Yes, that, that is correct. Uh, so yeah, if it helps you to think of like the equivalence thing, just think of these different statements as different versions of Spider-Man, and they're really kind of the same thing, just slightly different or maybe a slightly different coat of paint over it. Okay, so uh, wish you the best of luck on everything. Have a good weekend. Uh, hopefully you started the assignment by Friday, which is when you should be watching this. And you should have your tutorials today if you already haven't. Uh, so definitely attend them if you're hearing this before the tutorials. Okay, have a good weekend, and I will see you all hopefully on Monday during office hours. Talk to you later. See ya!